Brew Strong is brought to you by Blickman Engineering, home of the Riptide. Visit them online at BlickmanEngineering.com. for the beer radio you've been looking for. This is the show that dispels myths, tackles the toughest topics, and makes no apologies for geeking out on beer. Hosted by two guys that drink before they think, Jamil Zainashef and John Palmer. This is Brew Strong. Hey, howdy, hey, my Bruin brothers and sisters. Howdy, hey, howdy. Good to see you all again. See, you just totally confuse me each time. <laughs> okay, next time I'll say howdy, Cretans. So. <clears throat> I don't know. It's just like you're changing my it's world. Too. It's very <laughs> difficult for me. Uh, what can I say? I love variety. I've been working on all, all my shower things and, and my, uh, my toiletry counting and... Uh, and then I optimized, you know, so you got like a little shower squeegee to clean the, the, the yeah, glass the doors. doors and everything out and the walls. And so I've been uh, optimizing my squeegee uh, pattern. And uh, <laughs> I gotta say, I've shaved a few seconds off of my squeegee time. You know, it's, that's it's, interesting. The, the amount of, you know, uh, combining the amount of squatting and standing. Oh yeah, yeah. The, you know the pattern because you can't. You know, uh, I've been uh, I've been working on my 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 uh, squeegee action. Uh, I can I can understand that because I generally I try to avoid squatting. I just do you know quick vertical wipes and then do one squat and do one low row across the bottom of both doors. Right. So I minimize that squat time. Yeah, yeah, because they're squatting and rotating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you squat and rotate, that's can be more difficult on you when yeah. you're when you're working the squeegee. And I've taken a couple of bad slips in the bathtub trying to do that too. <laughs> there you, there yeah. you go. Well, Just, you know, kettle over and whatever they call that and ass over T hill. Yeah. Something Ankles like in the air and, and uh you're sliding <laughs> down the tub and it's amazing I haven't gotten a concussion from that. Well, maybe you did. You just don't know. It could be. Yeah. You know who probably also optimized his squatting and rotating is uh, our good friend. John Blickman. There you go. I bet you he has truly optimized his use of the squat and rotate, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, whatever purposes. I'm sure it was to uh, engineer some great new piece of equipment. Exactly. And, yes. You know, innovate your brew day, make things better for you. They, you know, Blickman engineering, a lot of times people think, Oh, you know, yeah, they, they got the uh, Terminator and the, uh, the beer gun. And then, uh, yeah, they make some other stuff. They actually make a full line of stuff from the anvil stuff, which is the more, uh, you know, uh, how would you describe it? Uh, uh, you know, sturdy, uh, you know, lower feature set. Well, it's the uh, Chevy compared to the Cadillac, I suppose. Right. Less bells and whistles. Yeah. And then uh, you go up to the, 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 the Tesla stuff and then you go on to, uh, you know, the industrial size. They actually make uh, right. commercial size uh, brew, brew houses too. So uh, check them out, BlickmanEngineering.com. They've been paying for the show so you don't have to for quite a few years. Uh, you looking for aliens outside your window or something? I think there's a SWAT team descending. I'm not sure. But uh, there's like a there's like a big C five cargo helicopter. Well, I don't see him here. Over. I don't see him here, so I don't know why you're looking in here. I don't see, I don't see. Him. <laughs> oh, that's that's a good point. Yeah. I don't see him. Uh, there are C fives flying uh, over overhead where I'm at. Uh, actually, we got some uh, KC tens and some C seventeen C fives. There you go. Uh, all three jets here at uh, Travis Air Force Base. They look like giant uh, vultures just circling the sky. And they look so slow. They're so huge. 
Uh, Isn't that impressive? Like they just barely, they, barely they hang moving. there. It's amazing. Yeah, something that big. They are they are impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyways, yeah. Uh, speaking of liquid engineering, something that big, very impressive. Um, <laughs> I really didn't know where I was going with the shower thing, but it paid off in the end, didn't it? It did. Yes, <laughs> it did. I, w- I was really surprised last show at the the absence of cider jokes. Um, the insider I, jokes, yes. Yes, we we restrained ourselves admirably. So pat <laughs> right. on the back. There you go. Well, I think Ryan was giving such great information that True. It, was, it was fascinating and a uh, really, really great guest. I'm glad, glad uh, we could have him. Uh, we're going to do a live Q&A for you today. So if you've got your questions, you're listening live, you can type those questions into the uh, comment section on Facebook just below the video there. And uh, our dear uh, Miss Beverly will uh, capture those and uh, report them on to us. Yeah, you can also send in your questions uh, via email uh, to uh, Bruce Strong at thebringnetwork.com, and we will eventually uh, get them. For example, here's one from January of 2018. Ooh, good it's, year. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, sometimes you got to let them ripen a little bit. Right. Because, uh, you know. Until we figure out the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Or until we sober up enough to, uh, to yeah. get to it. That's just the way it goes. Uh, Michael writes, gentlemen, I have a question about mash pH that's always confused me, and I hope you can help me out. As John often references, in northern Minnesota, Minnesota, we have uh, plenty hard water. And thanks to your help, I've been able to adjust my water profile fairly well. Don't you know? Don't you know? <laughs> However, what baffles me is when I continually read and hear that mash pH dials in about after about 10 to 15 minutes, and that's when I'm to take a pH reading. From my personal from my personal experience, my mash pH continues to adjust for a good 30 minutes before setting in at roughly 5.5 is typically desired at room temperature. My question is, what is more important, initial mash pH after that 10 to 15 minutes or the final mash pH after 30 to 60 minutes? I typically find that after 10 minutes, my mash pH is closer to 5.8. And then over the next 20 minutes, it lowers to 5.5 on most brews. Is the damage already done after the first 10 to 15 minutes of higher pH? Or is the ending pH all that really matters? Thanks for everything you do, Mike. It's a great question. Um, It's an excellent question, I thought. I was very impressed by Mike's question. Yeah. Well, uh, let's... less impressed by our answer. (laughs) (laughs) Let's address it this way. When we talk about, you know, trying to target a mash pH, we are talking about the beginning of the mash because, you know, we're, we're looking for those benchmarks uh, as we start the mash and saying, are we in the right ballpark? And that's where the 5.2 to 5.6 comes in. Those are uh, the, the benchmark area that we're trying to target. Now, depending on the chemistry of your particular mash, if there's enough calcium and so on, you will have this calcium phosphate reaction occurring during the mash that will continue to lower the pH during the mash. So your end of mash pH is going to be different than your initial pH. And he alludes to that and where he's saying that he sees it continuing to fall from 5.8 down to 5.5. And that's fine. From a, you know, from a teaching point of view, from a benchmark point of view, we're looking for that 5.2 to 5.6 at room temp at towards the beginning of the mash. And I say, you know, wait five to 10 minutes after doughing in just to get everything wet and try to, uh, you know, get a, a less than superficial pH reading. But it will continue to decrease. Um, monitoring pH for professional brewers especially is very important throughout the brewing process because it's really one of your best ways to track the consistency of your beer batch to batch. The end of mash pH is an important number. And I know many professional brewers that pay more attention to their end of mash pH than they do to the beginning. Um, 
you know, and that's fine. Um, whatever works for you. Um, later on in the brewing process, you are looking for um, lower pHs, and especially after fermentation, you're looking for a beer pH somewhere in the four to four and a half range, typically. So, um, yeah, don't get too wrapped around the axle in terms of what it is initially, but that th this is the trend we're looking for. It seems like 5.8 to 5.2 is quite a large drop, almost like he's lacking in buffering or maybe not really getting his mash fully mixed to start with and whatever additions happen. he's doing. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe maybe that's part of the issue. It seems like a substantial drop. Um, also, well, maybe he's... Um, you know, checking at different temperatures. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, you know, the mash is actually pretty comfortable at higher mash. Yeah, pH. conversion happens right. easier. Even, yeah, easier at higher pH. At higher pHs. It's at the end that you really need to be lower. So a higher one at the beginning is not a big deal. You just need to hit that end, end pH level because – you know, after after the mash and after boil, you need to be down, you know, around five. And then because if you don't ferment out your beer and end up in the low fours, it's you're not actually getting, a, you know, a good process all the way through. Yeah. John was saying four or five it, 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 heavily dry <laughs> beers. Total, totally different story. Yes. But, you know, in generally beers, you know, lagers, things like that, you're looking for like, you know, a 4.2, four, 4.3 four, type of pH. And if you don't get the pH down low enough in your mash, you're going to have trouble achieving that. You're just not going to make a great tasting beer. So that's that's one of the yeah. issues there. The one other pH thing to consider is uh, your laudering pH, your, the pH of your runnings. And... Uh, this is where you want to be down in the low fives as opposed to the high fives because in the five, eight and above, that's where you can start running the grain astringency issues. So, uh, yeah, beginning of the mash, conversion, five, eight, not a big deal. End of mash, when you're starting to lauder, you want that pH to be lower to prevent astringency. Mm -hmm. There you go. Good answer. All right, let's take a short break when we come back. We'll have more of your questions right after this. Are you looking for a simple brewing system that's great for all grain brewing, but everything on the market seems to be full of compromises? Blickman Engineering has the answer. The Blickman Brew Easy All Grain Brewing System. The Brew Easy is a complete system with easy upgrades and a beautiful compact design, perfect for any size brewing location. At its core, the Brew Easy is built on two gorgeous Blickman Boilermaker brew kettles, a high temperature March pump, and either a top tier gas burner or the new boil coil electric heater. The Brew Easy adapter lid allows the pots to stack on top of each other, forming an efficient, strong, and compact brewing setup that comes in 5, 10, and 20-gallon batch sizes. Upgrade your Brew Easy system with full automated control by adding a Blickman Tower of Power temp controller and make moving around easy with the Blickman Kettle Cart. The Brew Easy is modular. If you already own a Boilermaker kettle, you can build your Brew Easy by purchasing just the modules you need. The new Brew Easy all-grain brewing system. See it today at BlickmanEngineering.com and brew with Blickman quality on your new Brew Easy. Back to the two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. All right, we're back. Uh, we are uh, <clears throat> doing some live Q and A here. Uh, another good question from uh, Tyler. Uh, hi, Jamel and John. Uh, what are your guys' opinion, uh, opinions about the low oxygen brewing theory uh, that says reducing oxygen ingress on the hot side will enhance fresh malt characteristics in the finished beer? And he provides a uh, web link to lowoxygenbrewing.com. I believe this theory is similar but different than the hot side aeration debate from a few years ago. I always look forward to Brew Strong podcast. Keep up the great work, Tyler. Um, 
<laughs> I've, I've always, you know, been on, on the side of, uh, you know, don't worry about hot side aeration. Uh, fermentation will fix any, any issues possible with that. You know, good fermentation uh, is key. I went to the website that he mentioned, and I'm not sure where a lot of that information comes from. They didn't have any uh, uh, footnotes, any any references to uh, you know any sort of actual material. It just seemed like, I mean, maybe it's based in in science and fact, but uh, I could not. It just seemed like a bunch of suppositions about oxygen being horrible for your mash, um, which again, I only had a few minutes to take a quick look at it, but uh, I, I would not worry so much about oxygen in the, in the mash. I don't think it's really deteriorating the malt. Um, for example, your malt right now is sitting in a high oxygen environment or, you know, the air that we breathe, I mean, a relatively high oxygen environment. And, uh, you know, when you crush it, you know, some people uh, they get their malt crushed and, uh, you know, they'll wait a couple of days and then, and then they do their mash. Um, yeah, I, I, I try and avoid, I think I would avoid whatever, uh, pre- you know, reasonable, reasonable. Like I wouldn't, crush my, my malt, my malt, and then, you know, wait a month, you know, in a hot, humid environment before using it, right. I would try and, you know, do what I could to crush it, you know, just before use, I'd try and keep my malt, you know, dry and, and, and you know, sealed in the container, yeah. Yeah, sealed the container. Um, I would, uh, you know, but I wouldn't, it, it, it looked like this was suggesting going to some extreme lengths, trying trying to minimize oxygen, like floating things on top of the mash. And I'm like, I just think that that's a total waste of time. Yeah, I and I agree. I, the, the premise of Lodo is that you, by using these these low oxygen, low dissolved oxygen, you know, procedures that you can better um, better realize the fresh malt character that you get from German beers. Well, that's a faulty premise right there because you and I have both been to Germany. They don't brew like that. They mm-hmm. brew like everybody else. And if the beer taste has a fresh malt character, hey, it's fresh. You're right there in Germany, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. The beer was made recently. If you're brewing using Weirman malt, for example, here in the United States, and that beer is fresh, you have you should have every reasonable chance of creating equally fresh beer without you know these extreme low low dissolved oxygen nitrogen blanket methods and so on. So, um, a lot of what what makes a uh, uh, a beer tastes fresh or malt tastes fresh is the process of the maltster. You know, the, the, the growing conditions of the malt has a huge uh, effect on it. Uh, you know, moisture and, you know, sun and all this stuff. And then uh, the harvest and the time and the, and the, the malting of, of it and uh, even the kilnling of it, you know, mm-hmm. the, the times and temperatures and things like that really have a huge impact on the aromatics and you can, you can take, you know, essentially what should be the same malt and, you know, it, it varies over time. I think the, 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 I, I've read studies where people, or I shouldn't say studies, but I've read um, reports of people having done triangle tests with beers made with these Lodo methods. And they were able to, you know, differentiate the beers from another control. And that is probably true that by using these methods, you can produce a different tasting beer. The question becomes then, how significant is that difference? And maybe it, it is... And does it taste better? Yeah, and does it taste or better? Or does it just taste, taste different? Yeah. And maybe it's important in terms of overall flavor stability when you're talking mm-hmm. about a six-month shelf life. 
Mm-hmm. Maybe these things can you know, generate a benefit down the road. Mm-hmm. But in terms of, uh, you know, home brewing and, you know, uh, shorter uh, uh, consumption life of, of, of beer, you know, higher turnover, in other words, I don't think they're worth the investment and time and equipment well, trying to achieve it. And what you're going to do once you've got your work is you're going to bubble oxygen into that. Yeah. You're going to add oxygen on purpose, you know, and the reason is the yeast will take up uh, oxygen. A lot of these, these compounds that are produced during the mash, if it's got any sort of oxidative thing at all, uh, the yeast will take it up. That's kind of their, you know, gimme, gimme, it's their candy. So um, I think, you know, I just, I would not put a ton of effort into it. And I, you know, it's, it's like so many other things. Um, you know, you got to worry about fermentation first and temperature control of your fermentation right. and right. sanitization and cleaning. And, you know, and once you get through all those and then you've dealt with, you know, a number of these things, well, then, you know, in your packaging, especially. And then once you've got that, then maybe you start worrying about water. And then, you know, maybe after water, then you start worrying about like weird mash things. And, you know, and then maybe you kind of somewhere you may eventually get to this. But then I, I, I tend to doubt uh, you know, when people say that they've perfected everything about their brewing and, you know, now they, they, you know, they're working on like the last few things because it's just not the way it works. Uh, trying to perfectly replicate every step, every time, every beer, uh, is a challenge, you know, to, you know, you, you should still be working on reducing oxygen and packaging or, you know, getting the healthy, you know, viable yeast pitch at the right cell count uh, yeah. in the right nutrients. And, you know, there's just so many other things to worry about. It's interesting. I appreciate uh, Tyler bringing it up and, yep. and, yep. and uh, you know, I, I thought it was a good question, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't think either you or I are going to worry about that. Right. Our bro. Okay. Uh, Jason is asking about storing sanitized vessels. He says, hey, guys, I usually try to clean and sanitize right after emptying things like kegs, carboys, or starter flasks. Good idea. You let it sit dirty. It just makes it that much worse. It covers them with an airlock or tinfoil after I let as much star sand drip out as possible. When I go to use them again in a month or so, I'll rinse with water and sanitize again. But I'm wondering if this is an unnecessary step. The residual moisture makes it look wet and humid in there over time, which makes me want to rinse it out. But I guess it's still sanitizer in there. Probably another case of overthinking things, but still probably a good practice for things like flasks. Thanks, Jason from BC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's a common question. Um, I, But I think, you know, if it's been sanitized and then it's been covered with something that's airtight, like the aluminum foil, it's still sanitized months later, especially, you know, if you've done everything right. So I really wouldn't worry about re-sanitizing or rinsing at that point, especially with star sand. Yeah. You know, um, so I think this comes from, Maybe a discussion we had back in uh, 2007, 2008, probably. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. so. Uh, I think it was August, 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 maybe 13th. August okay, 13th. yep. Uh, it was about 2 p.m. Two, maybe mm-hmm. maybe scrolls about the two two o five mark. Yeah. Uh, no, um, where... I mean, this question has come up before, and one of the thoughts is, well, the sanitizer that's in there is no longer sanitizer, right? It has become neutralized over time, and star is not effective past, you know, uh, you know, you, you wait a month, it's probably not really sanitizer right. anymore, especially in small amounts with a large surface area. Um, and so the reasoning goes, perhaps your sanitizing was imperfect to start with. I mean, if you had a sterile vessel, yeah, we're talking sterile and you, it was sealed, it would still be sterile later. 
That's Nothing's, right. you know. However, if you had perhaps an imperfectly clean vessel and the sanitizer, you know, was protected, uh, you know, bacteria is protected or yeast was protected from the sanitizer by a little bit of, uh, you know, protein buildup or something. And eventually the sanitizer breaks down and now the bacteria is growing in a nice, moist, warm environment, uh, feeding off that protein. Uh, here's your potential for a problem. So I think, you know, especially a month, I used to clean all, all my kegs, you know, drain them out, CO2, purge them, pressurize them. And then, you know, a month later I would fill them. If they still had CO2 pressure on them, I'm like, they're good to go. If it didn't yep. have CO2 pressure on it, I'd go ahead and reclean it and figure out what gasket was wrong and mm -hmm. all that. So, um, yeah, I think uh, generally you're, you're probably fine, but you're not being, uh, you know, totally crazy just giving it a quick rinse. I wouldn't bother cleaning right. it again. I wouldn't bother rinsing it and then sanitizing it. I would maybe pardon me, give it a, a, you know, quick spritz of, uh, you know, star sand from a bottle, around around, the top. shake it out, yeah. you know, and you, and you're good to go, but it's, you're not being crazy, uh, especially, you know, to, you know, how expensive some of these homebrew batches are. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, a little bit overkill. Yeah. But you know, eh, better safe than sorry. It takes you a moment, especially if right. you got the sanitizer mixed up. I agree. Um, yeah. And if you're brewing that day, you know, fill in your flask with sanitizer, mix up some sanitizer in the flask and then pouring it in your spray bottle to be ready for the day. You know, there you go. Two, two birds, one stone. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Andrew uh, writes, he says, uh, while you're all on oxidation, do either of you have thoughts on TPO reduction for cans on manual seamers? Any thought on can conditioning partial or full as a means of TPO reduction? Oh my God, TPO, this is the bane of my existence. Um, I mean, you know, with with a with a full on commercial canning line, it's fairly easy to get your your package total pack TPO is total package auction down um, on a manual seamer manual fill. The easiest way to get your TPO down is to first purge the can with some CO2, second, fill it as quietly as you can, quiescent fill, as uh, Blickman is, uh, uh, says. Mm -hmm. And uh, because, because the more agitated the surface, the more surface area you're presenting to the atmosphere um, and picking up more oxygen. Uh, fill it all the way to the top and then drop your lid on, uh, not flat, don't drop the lid on, boom, but drop it on this way. Okay. And if you can yeah. foam it up at the end, that's fine. And then drop it on this way so it squeezes out the foam. And then uh, you should get a fairly, as low a, a TPO as you're going to get. Uh, when you are counting on foam to uh, reduce your package oxygen, the problem is foam's better than empty airspace. Right? Yeah. It will chase out some of the air, but it has tremendous surface area and it will pick up oxygen really quick. And then that gets uh, into your beer. Uh, the reason people do it is so that they can have a properly filled vessel, a bottle with a little bit of empty space, a can with some empty space. But if you don't care that when people open it, they get splashed by beer, <laughs> you fill that thing to the top and you will get um, the lowest uh, DO you're going to get. Um, you know, if you're commercially doing it, it's not, not so bueno because um, you're supposed to fill to a specification. Uh, what else was I going to say? Uh, uh, the... Again, you know, being able to uh, get rid of that foam. If you if you're unable to fill quietly, and it is foamed, uh, one of the ways you can remove the oxygen that's in there, especially if it splashes at the bottom when you first start filling, uh, that creates foam. That foam has a lot of oxygen in it, and when it rises to the top, if you can get it proud of the the top of the can, and then slice it off like a 
Belgian beer server, you know, slice that foam off flat and then it'll rise up a little bit more, make it another dome and then drop your lid on at an angle. Um, and then I'll squeeze the rest of that out. Uh, by, by slicing off that top of foam, you're slicing off a lot of oxygen that was in there. So, yep. That's one thing I was going to bring up. There you, you go. Uh, um, tell the readers or the listeners what uh, TPO target they sh- could try to shoot for. Well, uh, in bottles, it's possible to get down to, you know, zero, you know, uh, five, five or less uh, parts per billion on, on most meters is essentially zero because uh, that's kind of their accuracy. Okay. Um, but, you know, if you get below, you know, 50, uh, you can get below 100, I guess. Um, it's Parts not horrible. Billion. Not horrible. Um, you know, in cans, generally, uh, and Budweiser's cutoff is, you know, 120 parts per billion. Uh, a lot of uh, craft brewers, you know, they will throw cans away at 100 parts per billion. Um, some have no idea what's in their cans. Uh, but you should be shooting for 50 or below. Generally, as you're running, you want to be in the, you know, maybe the 30 parts per billion range. Uh, if it gets to 50, that's okay. But you should start looking at what's going wrong. If you're getting past 100, then, you know, you need to shut it down and, uh, and start over. Um, what about, uh, uh, you know, doing any sort of... Uh, can conditioning. Have you done any can conditioning, uh, John? Is your is your can conditioned? I, yeah, no, I I haven't done any uh, can conditioning myself. I don't have a uh, home seamer, um, but uh, can conditioning is is same as bottle conditioning. You're canning with some priming sugar and letting it uh, scavenge oxygen that way. I'd just be real careful uh, because the cans will. Uh, you know, they say they're good to about 30 PSI before they, uh, uh, you know, well, before they reverse their, their structure and, and start <laughs> to bubble out. Um, but I, I found it's much less than that because we've, we've canned some stuff to, uh, you know, uh, three volumes. And if you let it get hot, um, you know, oh. it, it you'll you'll see those cans pop. Uh, you know, they they won't give up the ghost, but they can uh, they can bulge, bulge. Yeah, so uh, they really don't hold that much. Three volumes is what uh, forty five psi or so. Yeah, I'd say they're good to ninety. I I don't believe that crap. <laughs> I think they're they're weak as can be. Uh, speaking as week of weak, we've got to take another break. We'll be okay. back right after this. Learning to brew has never been so disgusting. This is Brew Strong. All right, we're back. Uh, we're talking uh, all sorts of interesting things. Uh, package oxygen, enzymes, enzymes. Uh, Sean asks, hey guys, I have read about amylase enzymes working in certain parts of the process outside of the mash, i.e. not in at the 130-ish to 160-ish sacrification temperature. My question is, how do the enzymes work in, in say, 68-degree Fahrenheit beer? Don't they have to be in their temperature window in order to work? Thanks, Sean. No. Good answer. All right, we'll move on <laughs> to the next one. <laughs> no, it's a great, it is a great question, Sean. And the, the longer answer is that enzymes are catalysts and they do work best within their prescribed windows, but they will also work colder. Um, so, and if you think about it, you know, you look at the barley in the field, you know, it's growing, it's using its enzymes and it's only, you know, 50 degrees out. Um, 
the, the enzymes work at those temperatures. They work faster when they're warmer, but if you do go too warm, then they denature. And that means that they unravel. The structure changes and then they no longer work as the enzyme or catalyst on the substructures that they're supposed Freeze, to. Freezing could uh, denature the enzymes as well. That's right. As well as high alcohol. Uh... Yeah. There are a variety of conditions that will denature them. But in general, they will work um, at ambient temperature, lower than ambient temperature, um, as long as you're not going to extremes. All right. Uh, Justin uh, asked, uh, hey, guys, I just finished listening to your show on attenuation while brewing yesterday and I have a question about the beer I did. It's a stout that started at 29 Plato, and when it went down this morning, it had blown its top, and he sent a picture, yeah. uh, and uh, it blew some of the, the, the croissant out onto the ground, and his worry is that uh, it may not fully attenuate because it lost some critical amount of yeast. I wouldn't be worried about that. Um, the croissant is full of active yeast. And I think, you know, if even there are, there are many commercial breweries that actively harvest yeast during the ferment. Mm -hmm. um, top cropping. So, yeah, top cropping. So the loss of some yeast from the croissant, um, there's still lots of yeast within the body of the beer, so, you know, able to maintain that fermentation, I would not be worried about uh, loss of attenuation in this case. Right. Uh, I, I feel the same way. Uh, there, There's a ton of yeast in there, and most of what was up there, yes, it was the active, healthy yeast was, you know, in fermentation phase, all that, but, um, you know, there, there, there tends to be more than enough, and then, um, you know, maybe you lost a little bit of its ability as it drops back down through the beer to pick up any certain flavors, but uh, I really wouldn't worry about it. I think, right. I think it's fine. And especially in the picture, it did not look like that much yeast to me. Right. Um, if you had lost all your, your, uh, croissant, all your, and maybe all half your volume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then I'd be like, well, yeah, that, that might be a problem, but I, I, th I think he's going to be just fine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know who's just fine? Our good friends, Josh and RJ at Brew Chatter. They have a fine homebrew shop. Lots of great stuff. Uh, you got to go up there, John. You got to, or maybe you've already been up there. I don't know. When was the last time you were in Reno? Uh, about twenty-five years ago, I think. There you go. When you got released from Folsom Prison? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, me and Johnny Cash. Well, I don't think Brew Chatter was there at that time, but I think they will be here 25 years from now, still serving up great customer service, yes. great ingredients, fresh. You know, the place is well organized. It's, you know, they know what they're doing. These guys work really hard. They're there every day. It's not like, uh, you know, I love the weird little homebrew shops, but, you know, if you're, that's because I don't have to rely on, you know, a lot of, today you find some weird little things but you know being being able to go to a place that you can rely on faithfully to always you know got your back always take care of you always uh you know treat you right uh give you another nice. quarter for the slot machine give me another quarter for the slot machine right whatever else you you might want to do there in reno uh they'll hook you up there at brew chatter so go, go check them out uh brewchatter.com good folks all right. Uh, let's see here. Let's squeeze in one more. Blending beer. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Jeremy's asking, hi, guys. I love the show. I've been homebrewing for a year and uh, way more info than I, uh, and, and way more info than yeah, into, way more into it than I should be. Uh, thanks to Bruce Strong in the BM. I have an idea for a show topic. Blending beer. Blending is a common wine and spirits and barrel aged beer, but what about regular beer? Uh, I know it's a good way to use flawed batches. No, it's not a good way to use flawed batches. Eh, 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 eh. If it doesn't taste good, don't blend it. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm against that. Uh, case in point, I brewed a batch of Hefeweizen using WP320, the American Hef. It has no distinct esters, and I mashed it 
a bit low, so it lacks body. I have five gallons of bland 5% beer. I also have five gallons of a very robust porter. That's good, but a bit roasty for some people's taste. Blended, however, is quite, it is quite tasty, quite a tasty drink. I can even tell people I planned it all along. In the future, I might purposely tweak recipes with the intent of blending. Seems like with all the potential combinations with non-barrel aged beer blending, this can open up a whole new world of experimentation for craft brewers. I don't have a question per se, but I thought it was an interesting topic. Uh, Jeremy. Well, it is a very interesting topic. Yes. Yeah. Good question. Um, our friend Julian Schrago um, did an article on blending um, for the um, uh, the local MBA district, and I believe he also posts that in the um, in the uh, MBA technical quarterly. But he, he mentioned in there that yeah, you don't want to blend bad beers. You want, in fact, you actually want to create beers with an eye to blending. Mm -hmm. What kind of characters am I looking to blend uh, with another beer to create an interesting character? Um, so, you know, you are, you've, you've done quite a bit of blending there at Heretic, I imagine. Yeah, we do, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, barrel aid sours that, you know, we've got, uh, you know, one, two, three year, uh, barrels of, uh, sour base that we, well, we pick and choose barrels and blend. Uh, we do bourbon barrel aid stuff, same thing. And the, so, the story back in the day was, oh, these masters of blending will taste, you know, and this is what we were all told. They'll taste these barrels and they'll be like, ah, no, that's not good. I'll blend it with this one, which isn't any good, but in a different direction. And I'll blend these together and it'll turn out beautiful. And I think that that was a bunch of hooey. I think that, you know, somebody made this up or, you know, somebody was trying to pad their resume. I don't know what the hell was going on. But what I found is the more barrel blending I did or beer blending or uh, selection and blending is that, you know, by trying to do that, you're really taking bad beer and trying to dilute it out and, you know, kind of mask those bad characters. There's very rarely two characteristics that can be uh, set off against each other and turn out better. So I would say, you know, too thick a beer, too thin a beer, you know, too low an ABV, too high an ABV. Okay, I could see blending that. Um, you know, slightly too sweet, slightly too dry. Ah, okay, I, I, I could see blending that. But, you know, something where, oh, this is phenolic and this one is, you know, oh, sweet. <laughs> Now you're just blending crap and crap and you end up making, you know, four uh, really bad beers. And so what you want to do in your beer blending is, you know, uh, you know, find the ones that taste great on their own. And then you can take, oh, this great flavor and this great flavor. And now you got two great flavors or, you know, this one's fantastic, you know, and in this way aspect, this is fantastic in that aspect. And now I put the two together and oh my God, and, you know, the sum is more than, more than yeah. the parts. So, you know, I think all that is quite, quite possible, but like John's saying, you have to, you know, intentionally uh, blend the good stuff together. So, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, Jeremy's right that there's a whole new world of beer out there in blending and a lot of interesting things that can be done. You know, a, a American Hef and, and a Robos Porter, sure. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that can be done, but I, th I think it's not a way of getting rid of bad beer. Distilling is the way of getting rid of bad beer. <laughs> yes, right. Yes, yes. There you go. All right. Uh, one more short break, and then we'll be back uh, to wrap up right after this. Back to the beer guys that make other beer guys look like wine guys. 
Bruce Strong. All right, we're back. We're doing live Q&A here. If you got your questions, you can ask them. Uh, you know, just type them into the, uh, the comment section of, uh, of uh, the, the Facebooky right there. Uh, Jason's was asking, uh, I try not to use people's last names just in case. Although, you know, it's on Facebook. You just look it up, the Jason Simmons app. <laughs> you should cover professional top cropping procedures, average cell counts, pitching rate, and such. Did we not cover that before? I don't think we fully covered top cropping. We talked about no, that's right. We talked about how to harvest yeast. Yep. And we went through the various methods of harvesting yeast. But I don't think we went that fully deep into top cropping, cell counts, pitching rate, and such. I should get one of my friends from England that does a lot of top cropping to join that would us be for a good show. Good show, yeah. That'd be a good show. I think Jason, thank you very much. I think that's uh, that is quite helpful. I'll just have to remember that after I have a few more drinks today, and uh, we're good to go. Somebody, somebody, type that up and send it to me. Uh, one last question from uh, Joe. Joe says, "Hey guys, love the show. I've been brewing for about six months, and I've been slowly catching up, learning a lot, and appreciate all you guys are doing." His question is: I recently started using oxygen when I pitch yeast. I've noticed a huge difference in my beer. I'm wondering if there is any advantage to using oxygen when I do a starter. My general procedure for starters is to do a starter with a stir plate in a flask, wait for it to finish, let it settle out for 12 hours, then put it in the fridge for a day or two until brew day. Brew day, I take it out first thing in the morning, so I, it slowly works its way up to room temperature before I'm ready to pitch. I generally chill my wort, then transfer my wort to my fermenter, I have the catalyst, so I cover it and wait about two to three hours for the troop to settle and then take out a 32-ounce jar of troop before pitching the yeast at the same time as filling the fermenter. I generally add some of the work to my starter to get the yeast started, so when I pitch it, it is already starting to work. I add 60 seconds of oxygen or so at the time of pitching. I've read that adding oxygen while using a starter is not needed due to the fact that the stir plate is bringing in oxygen from the air as it's doing its work. A little vortex there. My yep. thinking is that uh, wouldn't a shot of oxygen when the starter is made and possibly filling the headspace of the flask give an extra boost uh, to help the yeast get going? What are your thoughts on this? Thanks again, and brew strong. Yep, good question. I can see where that, you know, you, all of the information has come to it. He's thought about it and thought, you know, how you do, how do you extend this? How do you uh, so Getting even better? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think it's you with a with a starter in a, you know a starter jar on a stir plate. You've got enough oxygen there. You don't need to add more, and too much oxygen can be bad. Um, yeah, in a stir plate situation, it's it's fairly benign, but. If you, t- if you leave your yeast on the stir plate for an extended period of time, two days, you know, for example, um, they are going to use up all the fermentable sugars. They will go through their nutrients. So they'll have to start burning their glycogen reserves and treolose reserves using the oxygen that's coming in from the air. So you can actually we- weaken the yeast and end up with, you know, a starter jar fully weak yeast if you leave it too long. Mm-hmm. And so adding oxygen to that stir plate could exacerbate that issue. I'm with you 100%, John. Um, yeah, so the air that's coming in is good. You want enough oxygen so that they are not really getting into a fermentation phase, that they, you know, it keeps them in growth phase as long as possible. And what John mentions, actually, you know, the, the, the way to get your yeast to take up more for their glycogen reserves is to uh, not wait for your starter to fully ferment out, but crash your, your starter uh, just as they're nearing the end. I forget how many points away you should be, but towards the end of fermentation, while they're still in that phase, if you crash them down a little early, you actually bi- build up bigger glycogen reserves. Uh, so, uh, you know, 
the, and the reason for chilling it is really to get them to drop out so you can decant the spent uh, starter wort. Yeah. Uh, which what is, do they call that beer? Um, uh, Knopf beer or something like that? I forget. I don't know. They have, they have a uh, word for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I like the idea of, you know, on brew day, uh, generally I would do this, um, if I had a starter, you know, I would try and time out the starter and the decanting and all that for, for brew day. But, you know, especially if you're, you know, repitching harvested yeast, one of the things I liked doing was adding, uh, some wort into it, you know, uh, earlier in brew day and letting that, the yeast get active and then just pitching the active stuff. And sometimes there would be a little bit of, uh, you know, s- slow stuff off the bottom or dead stuff on the bottom that I would, that I would dump as well. But, uh, I mean, I think your process, Joe, it sounds really good. Uh, mm-hmm. I would not worry about adding more oxygen. Like John says, you, you can add too much and actually harm the yeast. Uh, and I think you know, the only thing I would change in your process is maybe, you know, cooling it down. Just, you see the, 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 the activity start to ebb in the starter and it looks like it's, it's going to come to an end in the next, you know, six hours or so. Uh, you know, that's your time to pull it off the stir plate, you know, get it in the fridge, let that thing crash and uh, you'll get your, your healthiest yeast uh, reserved that way. That's one of the tricks that the uh, yeast manufacturers do. Yeah. They, they know exactly when to, uh, to chill the yeast down. Yeah, well, they can measure all that, yeah. Um, one other aspect to the question, I think, uh, people talk about aerating the starter and not aerating the wort. And hmm. uh, in theory, you can do that. You know, you're, you, what you're going to do is supply the yeast all the n- sterols and lipids they need prior to pitching. Right. But to do that, you've got to have the lab equipment to be able to assess that yeast in real time. It's a lot easier to not try to do that, but just aerate your wort and pitch and let the yeast take up what they need, you know, start evolving CO2, purge the vessel. Um, it, you know, it works beautifully. Right. Well, and, you know, you're providing the yeast with a whole new set of sugars, a whole new yeah. environment lower, lower yeast concentrations. So, uh, you know, it's, it's perfectly okay to go ahead and hit it with more oxygen, you know, at, at pitching time, because it is going to go through those growth, growth, uh, again, and can use the oxygen again. So, uh, there you go. All right. Another fine show. Thanks again to our great sponsors, Blickman Engineering. Uh, check them out, BlickmanEngineering.com. If you have a moment, please send an email to my friends at, uh, Lickman Engineering uh, feedback at LickmanEngineering.com. And let them know how much you appreciate they've been paying for the show. And our latest sponsor, uh, Brew Chatter, Josh and RJ, wonderful folks. You can email them too. I think it is uh, help or info at uh, brewchatter.com. I'm sure they will let me know. They actually listen to the show. So, That's nice. Nice guys. If you're ever up there, John, you got to come up visit me and uh we'll go to reno one of these times you will love it out there we, we, all right i did a uh, a tasting session out there with some of their customers it was a blast oh, very great. cool okay we'll do that so check them out all right uh thanks everybody for listening uh keep on brewing and until we see you again uh, brew strong brew strong everyone